Welcome back guys, uh, this is our second video on gas power cycles and we're going to introduce some basic nomenclature for gases. So let's start by uh, an overview of reciprocating engines. Uh, this will be true for diesel and auto cycles that we're going to see next. And um, we would like to explore, we're going to start by uh, defining some basic concepts. Um, first of all, we are going to define, um, sorry about that, we're going to define a piston cylinder and this piston cylinder will work as we said for the spark ignition which is the auto and the compression ignition which is the um, diesel cycle. Okay, first of all we need to recognize that this is a closed system. We are even though in, the, in both cycles we have inlet and outlet of air and fuel, we're going to assume that we are going to close this here at the valves you know, on that imaginary line. So once we have mass inside the cylinder, we get the same mass over and over again. This is actually not true, but this is part of the assumptions that we are making. So we have this cylinder and this piston and the cylinder will move between two limits. We're going to define the top limit or the further upward that it can get the piston as the top dead center. It cannot go any further than that because we need some space because of tolerances and because in real life we need some space for these valves to open and close. So we need to leave this space here. So that is a uh, volume that we have to begin with. If we move uh, the most forward down that we can get, I mean the, the, the lowest point that we can get is what we call the bottom dead center. That bottom dead center uh, defines the maximum displacement downward that the piston can make. The difference between these two numbers is what we call the stroke. And that's the vertical distance that the piston will move. Okay? If we multiply the bore or the area that this piston has times the stroke, we will have all this volume. This is the volume of gas that we are displacing, or this, the, 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 the volume displaced within this. So let me just change this a little bit this volume that we are displacing is equal to the area of the cylinder which is pi times the bore and expressing here as a cylinder square divided by 4 times the stroke which I call L so this is this volume is the displaced volume we have a second volume that we are going to uh, Okay, I'm just emphasizing that this is the displaced volume. But we have a second volume that we cannot move. We have, we begin with that, and at the end of the compression, we have that. Okay, um, this volume that we are displacing is equal to the work. Um, if we assume we can uh, get a function the pressure function of volume and we integrate that pressure by this um, delta V, this displaced volume, we can get to work. Now, as I was saying, we have a volume that we cannot get use of and that's a clearance volume. That volume that we need for those valves to move. So that clearance volume we also call dead volume. And it's dead volume because we cannot get work out of it, but we introduce work to it nevertheless. So, next parameter that we would like to define is the mean effective pressure. We have said that the area enclosed in the cycle is the network. And we also said that this pressure that we have is changing with volume. So that's why we need to define an integral and we need to find out our functional relation between pressure and volume. 
let's say that we would like to have um, average pressure such that when I have um, just the, 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 the volume difference, I can get the same work. Well, that is what we call the mean effective pressure. That is, the pressure that I have, the, the pressure that I can find such that we multiply by the same displacement. Remember the displaced volume is the difference between the bottom dead center and the top dead center. I will get exactly the same work as the one that I have in my actual machine. So, just to rephrase it, remember that um, we're going to find uh, area 1. Hold on, where's my cursor? I'll get it. Hold on a second, guys, sorry about that. Oh, here's. So, we're, as I said, we're going to have a constant pressure that when multiplied by this the volume difference, I'm going to get an area 1 that will be the same as this area 2 so pressure times volume difference I'll get network and it's represented by this area and should be exactly the same as this area of the network when I have A1 equal to A2, I know that I have um, the mean effective pressure. That's the pressure that makes this statement come true. Okay, so how are we going to analyze these um, processes? Because we just described uh, two processes that are isentropic compression and expansion and we can do it two ways we get and this um, is a refresh of the chapter 7 if you have any question go back to that chapter 7 so we start by saying that we have uh, this is the expression that we got in the entropy study to change to compute the change in entropy in a system as a CV times the natural logarithm of t2 over t1 divided by r sorry, plus r times the natural logarithm of p2 or v1 but this can be expressed also in terms of pressure which I am just uh, putting here in blue so we can start with any of these two so this, since this expression is the expression to compute the change in entropy in a system and we would like to have an isentropic system that means that this difference should be equal to zero so we're going to make this zero and then we're going to solve for um, t2 over t1 so we pass this number to the right hand side of the equation and we have natural logarithm of t2 over t1 equal to r over cv we are um, solving for t2 over t1 and uh, but you can see that in order to get rid of the natural logarithm we need to get this expression as an exponent of v1 over v2 and remember that this v1 over v2 is the compression ratio right we define the compression ratio as the maximum volume by the minimum volume this r this compression ratio which is volume not pressure is um, a characteristic of a system of, or, or a motor let's say that way so we want to uh, get everything in terms of t2 or t1 um, we have r over cp and uh, we would like to have it in a different format we remember that r the constant gas um, the, the the constant gas for that gas is um, Cp minus Cv so we substitute that R by as Cp minus Cv and we reduce that expression by separating 
and recognizing that this first term is k and k is uh, as we indicate here cp minus cb and second term can be reduced to 1 so that's where this expression comes from so every time that we have an isentropic process and we have information in volumes we can use this but please make sure that we use, use this only for isentropic processes and uh, if we start with volume with pressure instead of volume we will get a similar expression uh, I encourage you to repeat this um, analysis and you can see that you will get to this result and um, as I was uh, mentioning you can start instead of uh, with the expression of pressure the volumes we can start with the expression of pressures and we're gonna get this expression that CP natural multi 2 will be equal to R natural at P2 of P1 and manipulating algebraically same way we did it up here we're going to finish with this expression I uh, Again, I encourage you to do this at home, just to make sure that yeah, you have the same result. Okay, and remember this is for an isentropic process. If we combine these two, we can get a relation for isentropic processes that relate pressure with volume. With this, we have the three uh, variables connected for um, Asymptotic process. Remember, this is um, the way we analyze with constant specific heats. You can see that we have in the expression CP average. That means that we can get um, a value for the CP. We could be the, the beginning, or we can get the average of two temperatures, and then look for that in the appropriate table. And that table could be a2 and actually it's a2 and uh, we can see here that a2 we have a constant or variable data we have cp or cv at different temperatures so um, now let's explore the exact analysis in this case we start by um, writing the process and let me just write up here that uh, a specific heat is actually a function of temperature so that was one big assumption we, that we did with the approximate analysis now we are recognizing that a specific heat is a constant of, of it's a function of temperature and we are going to write the expression for the entropy difference for a system and it is S2 minus S1 and you can see that you have these little balls on top that means that these are values that are computed with a state reference so that's a change from state reference to the uh, state that I am looking for in this case S2 minus 1 and that integral, that the result of that integral already recognizes the variation with temperature. So if we make the temperature, the entropy difference zero, the same as we did in the past, we can solve for uh, P2 over P1. And we will have this E to the S2 minus S1 over R. And we can use loss of low of exponent 
to uh, express this difference as a ratio. So we will have P2 over P1 equal E to the S2 over R divided by E to the S1 over R. And you should recognize that this should be an dimensional number. You cannot have the exponent to a dimensional number. And because we start from pressure, we are going to call it relative pressure and we'll have no units. So we are, we are going to be changing this number e to the s over r. We are going to call it relative pressure. And since we have 2 and 1, we can call it relative pressure 2 and relative pressure 1. If instead of starting with the pressure definition of the uh, change entropy, we start with volume definition of the of, um, change of entropy, we'll have um, the result on the bottom. So here I'm just um, reinforcing that we have a dimensional numbers for pressure and volume, relative pressure and relative volume. So this is uh, what we got if we start with pressure definition and as I mentioned if we start with volume we'll have a similar relation. Next we're gonna solve, we're gonna see how to use these tables for just uh, computing and the end temperature of an isentropic process. Okay, we start. Uh, we, we're going to do this with an example using table A17. So, you know, to do this, let me change this the color of this pen. And let's assume that we have at the beginning um, a centripetal process. That's the first condition, right? And our initial temperature is uh, 37 degrees Celsius. And that we have a compression ratio of 9.2. Okay, we will like uh, we have a compression, so we have um, this is entropic process is a compression. And um, we would like to have T2 at the end of the compression process. And uh, we're going to use a constant uh, parallel specific heats. So we go to table A17 and we would like to use the expression that we just uh, derived uh, V2 over V1 equals VR2 over VR1 so table B16 V17 at T1 equal to 310 Kelvin Think why we, need, we, we must use Kelvin in our Celsius uh, We're going to explain it when we, saw auto, when we see auto But in the meantime you think about that And um, So we see that VR2, VR1 is equal to 572.3 so we solve for VR2 so VR2 will be VR1 times V2 over V1 
but we can recognize that this is the same as 1 over r. So we have pr1 over r. We substitute, we have 572.3 divided by 9.2. This is equal to 62.2. So we can see this is very close to 62.13 that we have on the table. What well, will we interpolate? To get, I'll put here exact. T2, and I said exact because this interpolate is a linear interpolation. So for, the, for this example, we are gonna assume this is very close, so we can see that T2 is equal to 730.